Hello my friends, I hope you had a fantastic day or night wherever you are. This week I'm back with a brand new episode of the podcast. We're going to be talking to Rob about print, marketing, networking and how you can t- continue to grow your business regardless of what the economy does because you're going to be creating that demand rather than serving the market demand. So if you did enjoy this episode, why not be subscribed so you do not miss next week and I'll pass you over to pass me to conduct this exciting interview. I'll see you very, very soon. So my name is Rob from uh, Witten Print Services. Um, I'm a freelance print buyer and I do all the sexy part of the marketing creative process in just getting things made from leaflets, brochures, catalogues, through to things like deck chairs, pens, uh, wheelbarrows, other things which are coming across my desk at the moment. Um, being a production person in the advertising world, so I started to work in the late 80s as a production person in a, in a large regional agency up in Yorkshire. Um, transitioned through into packaging, uh, worked in magazine and book production before moving back into the agency world as print production manager for one of the biggest agencies outside London. Um, fast forward a couple of years, worked then in print management, so working with clients like the BBC, Colt Group, Morrisons, uh, Unilever, BMW, Coke. So they a mix of some of the clients I've worked with on the print management side where we will be the incumbent supplier to manage all their, all their print work. Um, again, fast forward to three years ago, uh, obviously everybody went through COVID, um, I got made redundant and set my own business up offering that service to SME market uh, in managing anything printed, print related they, they are looking. Hurrah. I mean, I think the print space is a really interesting one. I mean, first of all, welcome to the show, etc. But I think so many people look at print as the old school way to do it, right? And as we were kind of talking about pre-show, I either look at it and I I always, when I talk to other marketers, I'm always like very biased towards video for obvious reasons, but I'm also very aware that whoever you talk to will change what they're going to say, right? So if you are talking to a um, a copywriter, for example, then they're going to say you need to do blog writing or you need to up your copy or you need to do this, etc, etc. If you're talking to myself, you'll talk about video. If you're talking to a web designer, you want to make a shiny website and you need to, uh, apparently we all need new websites every five minutes, right? Or if we're talking to yourself, you might then say uh, print. But I think that's where marketing can sometimes get slightly diluted. But there is a an argument which we made um, in the pre-show, which is where I wanted to start, which is about this cohesive message of how people actually have their retention span. Because I think sometimes we can be very, you know, social media is this new shiny thing, video is this new shiny thing, and yes, you should be leveraging it. But, you know, uh, you shared a, a really nice story uh, about a cartoon. I, I'd be wondering if you wouldn't mind just sharing it again, because I think it's really valuable and a really good articulation of actually how marketing works in a nutshell. Because I think sometimes we can be very oh the new shiny thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So the the cartoon I saw was was a couple of years ago. Um, chap walking down down, uh, or chap on his way into work is on the bus reading the magazine. He's listening to the radio, so he sees the same advert uh, for this shiny product on print and on the radio. He gets off the bus. He walks past the poster site again. Same shiny ad, uh, ad for the shiny product. Um, goes to his, so goes to the office, turns on his laptop, and he sees uh, a pop-up ad for the product, and then goes into video for the ad. So he's got all these various various messages he's been uh, in, but um, he's seen all through, throughout the uh, exactly yeah, seen all the way in, into work. He goes, I actually want one of those. Clicks on on the pop-up link, orders the product, and gets oh, place the order, pays for it. The cartoon then goes to uh, a boardroom scene. Um, where they're all talking about where sales are coming from. Sales are coming from the online channel. That's where the where the order point is. MD is saying we need to push online. That's where we've got to push our services, rather than looking at where that individual has, has been influenced on his purchase decision. That it's going to push online. You've got to my my personal feeling as long as it's consistent messaging across as many channels as you can do, and print is still relevant uh, because magazine trade is still there. Outdoor, out, out of home industry is still there, as well as as leaflets, brochures, and catalog, and, and everything else which which we can do as well. I think it's important to mention there it is it is relevant to the industry which one is is articulating into and, and yeah. trying to sell to. Right, there is like higher return on investment, arguably, if you're e-com, if you're gonna be you know mostly online anyway 
to be more online facing. But in the same way, if you're a physical store, restaurant, etc., 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 actually, I would argue print has worked for a long time and probably still does and should, right? Yeah. For those who are maybe new to the concept of marketing, new to the concept of etc., I mean, how do you market personally? So I market mainly through networking. Uh, so it's like talking to people. That's that's probably predominantly through my my own advertising. I've done do some print work. So I'm I'm going to be at an exhibition um, in in November in in Southampton. That's going to be heavily print based because that's probably the way, the the best way you can recruit your audience is is talking to people at the show and taking away material from you. Um, I do social media as well. I do engage with people. I do post on social media because again, it's a good way of promoting your message. It's it's about reaching your target audience and. Social media is one way to get it, uh, engaging with people to get it, and as well as print physical things through the door. And people still like receiving good targeted mail. Yeah, and I think that's the important point, man, right? It's like junk mail is only junk if it is uh, targeted to the wrong postcode, yeah. wrong people, wrong audience, in the same way any marketing. When it's targeted at the wrong people, it may be spammy, may be annoying, maybe etc. Because I had, a, I remember yeah. a couple of years ago, I had a conversation with a, a very old friend of mine who's very against the capitalist culture of advertising, right? And I was like, well, okay, I get your point. But if you were being advertised things you actually cared about and you've been introduced to products and services that actually could help fix problems that you have or move your business forward or move what you such right like value right they were valuable yeah. to you you wouldn't mind right and i think that's why we're more value centric than we are necessarily about oh my god i'm getting spammed by ads within reason right or i'm getting a load of junk mail yeah. through my post box or whatever right but i think you know for me and we sort of alluded to this when we when we started the, the the pre-conversation about christmas right because at the time of recording we're in back end of september and you know, it's kind of those things. I think sometimes people think, you know, we're miracle workers and we can magically make things happen really, really quickly for Christmas. The reality for most people at Christmas is actually they make their decision making like next month, like middle of next month into November. They don't actually make it in December because by that yeah. point they've kind of done it all. So if you're marketing your Christmas thing, your Christmas event, your Christmas chalet, your Christmas Santa Grotto, your 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 product service, whatever it may be for Christmas, that's the, that's the window of time you need to look at advertising it. And I think this actually, uh, we can focus on Christmas, but I think this is actually broad, uh, this opens up a broader conversation around how long does marketing take to work? Right, and why do people yeah. market in in general? And the the main reason why I bring this up is because I looked at it when I was getting into marketing and really starting to understand it. I was like, well, why are Coca Cola, McDonald's, Nike, all the Adidas, etc., etc., your other large brand here, still advertising? Right, because arguably they're huge. No one really needs to be introduced to. Did you know who Coca Cola are? It's like, mm, do you? Yes. Everyone kind of knows who Coca Cola is. But why would you say people need to continue to advertise when things are good? Because I think sometimes it can be very easy and very simple to go, well, we're busy. So why do we need to advertise? Yeah. We don't need more work now, right? Well, it's all about just building your pipeline for, for when you become quiet. Um, as, as you just said, we're, we're currently recording this end of September. It, just in the print industry, that's quite a busy period of time. But what I'm looking for is, is what I'm going to stop marketing my work for is that work for post Christmas, where again traditionally in the print industry it falls off a cliff in um, second week of December until probably February March when people start planning things for spring and into into the summer period. So it's it's just about building a pipeline. And again, people like Coke, they'll see their huge spike up to pre Christmas, and they fall off a cliff, and then you need to then push for drink Coke in Coke in, in the spring and into the summer. You've got the Olympics coming up next year. You've got the World Cup. Uh, so the Euro is coming up next year. It's all about the sponsorship related to those uh, to those events and promoting the goodness of drinking Coke because it does a lot of good things for for the sport in, sports industry. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I think I think a lot of it is around, uh, as we say, looking at the target audience, but also in general considering what because everything's like oddly lagged right in some ways right because when you want to start advertising stuff as you say like you're looking to new year you know we don't have seasons as such unless you're doing like seasonal yeah. targeted objectives around you know this is easter this is christmas etc a lot 95 percent of my work is 
this specific this specific project for general brand awareness or marketing right so that isn't necessarily time led but will still obviously run till certain deadlines and certain and certain um you know timelines for those but it's more around actually how can we create a infrastructure that allows you to be top of mind that allows you you know one of the main reasons why i have this show for example is it number one is a very key example of what i can do with video number one number two it also allows me to consistently show up on social media feeds and be like hey remember me hey remember me and because sometimes i think people as long as you're adding value people uh, when i started posting daily people were thinking people were talking to me about daily and it was like oh you're gonna spam people and it's like well it's only as we said it's only junk mail it's only spam if it's not valuable right or it's not valuable to that target audience and i think sometimes we get I guess in some ways concerned or in our own heads around like what isn't isn't valuable but the way I look at it is if all of your competitors are posting say let's just let's just use social media let's just focus on social media for a minute right let's say all your all your competitors are, uh, are posting twice a week three times a week if you're posting daily then you're in a stronger position because you're going to show up more often which in turn means you're going to be higher in front of mind and or higher chance that either a piece goes viral to the right audience or actually you have a higher chance of the right person at the right time connecting with that piece of content and connecting with you and building that trust level so then they're more likely to make a purchasing decision when it comes to what you're at what you actually sell right but why because again i think when when we look at as i alluded to in the beginning when we look at you know i'm gonna do video because it's what i sell right but why did you choose to do social media because it would be very easy for you because it's print you know that's what you sell that's what you do to just solely do print for your advertising right why did you choose to potentially do social media and how do you tackle that as like firstly like firstly why but then secondly how do you tackle it from a print point of view um so i, I yeah so social media it, it'll take pictures of things i'm just produced or delivering or um for example i was, I was at the print show uh, at the nec in, in september so last week as we're recording this um i posted I saw a printed cop, printed coffee cup where the print was actually on on the, the milk foam of the of the cup, so it had my image on the on, on the. On the oh, that's really cool, and that's the the print geek in me saying, "How's that possible? How did they do it?" And when you look at it and say, "All they've done is inkjet uh, food dye on top of the on top of the foam." Fairly simple, really effective, but it's a great thing to say. Look at this print, isn't it marvelous? I've been to the print show. I'm, I'm, I'd like to look at tech and like to, to, to look at the latest innovations. Um, I can't do that with print because I would have to be posting that and sending copies out to every every day. So the best way to do it is by social media. I don't have postage costs and I'm not going to say I should do direct mail when I've got to put, put, pay for the physical postage to, to get it through the door. It's, it's expensive. But if you want to do that, put that in your catalogue, your brochure, like I'm doing for, for, for the show in, in November, of look at this work I've done for in the hospitality sector, in, in, in the uh, public sector, in, in uh, the other markets I've, I've, my clients are based in, that yeah, I can do menus, I can do brochures, I can do side of buildings, I can do, um, I can do various other bits and pieces, I can do leaflets. So, and I'd work with this political party or this trade union or this uh, this client, which um, is, is is prominent in, the, in 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 people's eye. And then it's showing that, yeah, this person could do that work for me as well. And, and I think sometimes, especially it's... when you know, I, I hear this a lot when it comes to like showreels and and, and searching for video, because sometimes you need something tangible and visual to actually see, because it's very theoretical yeah. sometimes. It's like, oh, I'm amazing at video. Okay, but. If I don't see any of your video, I can't, charming, yeah. I can't justify that, right? In the same way with print and design and etc. as well. But I think the really important element is what we alluded to at the beginning, which is having that cohesive message where you do consistent elements and having that consistent yeah. kind of messaging across the board, but also measuring the ROI, but also understanding the ROI, as you alluded to in your, in your you know, cartoon analogy, that it's not just the point of sale necessarily, right? Because if yeah. you're just going to tangent with that, you haven't seen the lot, the broader picture. And if you just pump money into that online element, yes, you might have 10% uptake, etc. But what if you did that same, uh, you know, across the board and then split it across the entire journey? Actually, arguably, could you have a 20% or 30% or 40%? 
Im- improvement potentially yeah. you know but also as we say uh, initially when we look at marketing in general how what perception what reputation what brand etc all of these other elements you know why is coca-cola why is mcdonald's why is nike why is tesla why is all these large brands you know why do you and i know them and why can i leverage them and, and talk about them when it comes to a large well done brand because they mean something right they actually yeah. mean something when i say that Every single person who's watched this will watch this video will know who they are. Are you creating that level of emphasis? Now we're looking at top down. You know, we're looking at billion dollar companies. We're looking at massive amounts of money across a large period of time. Sure, but can you scale that logic down to base level, small level? Can you, you know, be known in your community? Can you be known in your networking groups? Can you be known in your city, your town, your county? for that reputational point of view so you are the go-to person i mean i guess that does yeah. open up a question because a lot of people who consume the show are between six months and and, and two years in, in in business right so some of them and a lot of them either don't do content don't do marketing don't do don't do a lot of this and they're maybe because it's worried feared scared i mean how did you get into networking and then also when you did how did you get over that concept of i've got to talk to new people because i think that's a really powerful starting point when you have a lot of time that you can use but also it builds your confidence which then allows you to do all the other things as well if you choose to potentially move away from networking and that's that's a separate conversation that i think we'll get onto afterwards but you know how did you just reiterate you know how did you either get into networking choose to go to networking if so why and then how did you get over the hurdle of oh my god i've got to talk to new people so networking um i i started when the business was three, four months old, I tried the traditional sales approach of cold calling uh, and and making contacts with people I thought were my my ideal client list. Um, This was during the first lockdown. Nobody was in. And uh, you couldn't get hold of people. You couldn't phone phone head office and say, I'm going to speak to Joe Bloggs because Joe Bloggs was working from home and all was furloughed and uh, all those kind of fun things we had in 2020. I got recommended to try networking. Um, so I'd, I'd seen a couple of posts people had put on at networking events, tried a few. Some were some were great, some weren't particularly great for from, 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 from my business. Not saying that they would be great for other businesses, but for me, for what I do, uh, it was the wrong target audience. Um, but then somebody recommended me only networking, um, which took my business up to the next to the, to the next level. So I was getting some really good work from, from from people within that network. And it was just about making connections, just building that relationship. I, me personally, I couldn't, I'm not particularly great at picking up a phone to somebody I don't know. But once you start seeing people two or three times and building that rapport, building a relationship with people, um, that's, that's what I like doing. And that's what regular networking allowed me to do. And then that grew, grew me into doing other networking, so BNI, FSB. Um, as this podcast is coming out, I'll attend my first Chamber of Commerce event. Um, and it, it's a lot of me to, to like meet yourself, uh, be on this podcast and, and and do other things and talk on the radio and talk about talk about my business and, and have that kind of exposure to, to again, to keep growing my business and, and, and keep progressing. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I talk a lot, I talk a lot about networking and I've, you know, I've talked about it a lot. I've done it for many years and it's incredibly valuable when you can get into the right target audience, you can build those relationships with those right decision makers. And it's not yeah. necessarily something that you should or shouldn't do. It's kind of a decision of, okay, where are you with your business? Like anything, you should you should track the ROI, you should track the understanding, you know, and, and this isn't aiming at only, this isn't aiming at anyone. It's just talking about networking in general as a whole because I made a shift as I was getting busier and I was doing a lot more and I was trying to do a lot more and expand in what I'm doing in both businesses. But in general, myself, yeah. I've taken a step back for the time being for from networking and it's nothing against those networks, yeah. as I say. It's purely around, okay, I have a specific set of skills and I'm specifically good at certain things and I'm at now at a level uh, where I can talk to people who I don't know very quickly but rapport very quickly. I, I can also do the cold sale aspect. I can also create content which allows me to scale what I'm doing and to scale that trust and uh, build that rapport. But also I can also leverage the six years plus that I've done of networking to meet people like yourself and etc. 
to potentially have a larger conversational piece around what we do how we do it but also my target audience has completely changed from where i was two three years ago four years ago during covid yeah. right so during covid we were like most just looking to survive just looking to be like okay this is an unprecedented time blah 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 blah. 95 percent of stuff is like completely illegal for a bit which was which was interesting and then you get to a point where it's like, okay, my demand is there and I have a lot I want to do, but I also want to grow these other things. I also want to do these other things, etc. So then it comes an allocation of time, right? So the conversations I always have yeah. with people regarding networking and, and regarding in general with how they're going to market their business is are, what resources do they have to give to their marketing? Because you either have time, money, or energy, right? So if you have energy, you can do content. In theory, if you if you have the right infrastructure and you you know you have the right skill set, if you have money, you can do paid ads. And but if you have time, you can do networking, right? If you if you have all three, you can technically start leveraging all three. But then the question comes is what's the return on that time investment, right? Because we look at return on investment when it comes to money a lot of the time. But one of the main categorical, I think, changing in mindset for me was around how do I get return on my time? So what time am I spending yeah. and what time am I investing? And how does it then generate me that return, et cetera, right? I mean, how do you measure then using following that logic? How do you measure return on your time as well as your money? Because money is quite easy, right? I put in 10 pound, I get 20 pound out. Fantastic, right? I've doubled my money. Magic, cool, fantastic. Magic money tree, wonderful. That's not what advertising is. It's it's a lot more complicated than that. You can get those kind of returns, but it, 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 it depends on your industry. It depends on how you're doing it, et cetera. How do you measure your time? your return on that time so i i measure my so i, I do the monetary for roa which you said is, is quite simple but i split that into how did i get this particular client and sometimes those clients can maybe across two three networks and then you have to try and work out how you're going to split that, that that return on the investment i tend to do it how did i meet that person first um i also record my my hours i spend working um used to do this when I worked in, in the corporate world because we had to report back to our client that we had full availability across the team. I then carried that into what I do now. So I record what time I start work, what time I have a lunch, what time I take the dog for a walk and all those kind of things. And then I split it down into, I spent an hour and a half networking uh, at B&I or only, and then calculate that 50 minutes, two hours on that particular networking meeting, total that up and then we'll work out what my, what my, Cost, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the cost, the, the the cost, yeah, yeah, um, and that's how I work out that, yeah, attending uh, BNI networking has resulted in me getting this figure of from the business, which work out at an hourly rate of of, of Y, and that's what I keep my return of. So the networking I've done, where it's it's sometimes it's more the social aspect, and, and while that's good sometimes to to sit and have a coffee and have a chat. Um, I think it, uh, sometimes you do need that return yeah, as well. I think it can be very, as I say, comfortable. It can be very comfortable to because it's very uh, endorphin firing when you're having all these one to ones, having all these great, great conversations. Yeah. But is that the yardstick you want to use for the return on that network? If that's the yardstick, great, fantastic, you're hitting those metrics. But actually, what's the yeah. tangible return sometimes? And if you're not getting that tangible return on actually business incoming and actually it it's doing the job you need it to do then like anything yeah. you should review it right i'm not saying yeah. cut it and i'm uh, it's ironic because a lot of people i talk to they've just come off either cutting their marketing spend completely or completely auditing everything they do with marketing and what i say to them is always very simple consider and what you should always try to do whenever you do any form of marketing is think okay how could this potentially generate me work today okay how could it potentially generate work in three months and also how could potentially it generate me work in a year because if you can do all of your marketing so it hits those three, you're a lot more, or any investment of time, energy, resources, energy, etc. How is it going to benefit your business short term, mid term, and long term? Because if you just look towards mid term and long term, you might go under before you hit there, right? That's the reality. Yeah. And then we're looking at an economic contraction where well, it's very possible that that's a reality for a lot of people, unfortunately, right? So you need to focus on that short term growth. And I don't think it's, I don't, I think sometimes we shy away from, I actually need to make money and I actually, uh, you know, potentially I'm either in trouble, where I'm not making money, or I actually need to make more money to make sure I'm fine, right? 
And I think sometimes, especially when it comes to content or it comes to, it depends on the network, but more specifically aiming at BNI or looking at how BNI works, I think you can be more selly in BNI. And you can be more yeah. direct in, in what you're looking for and how you're looking for it. Again, it comes back to the culture of the network. But I think for me, there's going to be a very interesting period coming soon looking at what happens in the economy. And of course, we don't know. It's all speculation. It's all opinion. But there's going to be an interesting reality in the near future where what I would describe as non-pure blood entrepreneurs, people who aren't truly wanting to be an entrepreneur, won't necessarily be able to make it through because for whatever reason. I mean, how do you like how do you validate I guess some of the question there is, how do you validate continuing to do stuff? I mean, do you have a similar yardstick in the respect to it has to hit those short term, midterm, long term metrics? Or is it more Yeah like how is it feeling based like is it purely data led like because i think so many people do it so many differently and that's why i'm always interested to talk yeah. to people about how they how they how they actually leverage it or how they actually look to, to to mark that and you said you know obviously you look at the networking thing and you say okay well i'm spending these hours and it means this much in money but how do you like how why i'll give you an example like why did you choose to come on the show right so what's the return on time or return on investment or turn on etc potentially from the show Right would be another example of something else that you've done that some people maybe for confidence issues or time investment issues or resources in general because sometimes I hear it as well it's like oh that's not for me because of the confidence thing or that's not for me because they're concerned about you know they need they need that money they need that turn right yeah. why would why should someone either have a show go on shows or or be in content in general would you say then. Because obviously you're an advocate for it because you're here, right? We're having this conversation now. Yeah. Well, for me, I love listening to business podcasts. That's that's it's during the day when I'm when I'm working. I listen to two types of podcasts: football co- podcasts and business podcasts, um, and a little bit probably of radio. What's happened over the weekend? Um, and for me, it's taking me out of my comfort zone. So I'm I'm not used to. This is my first ever podcast I've ever spoken on. Thank you. Um, and it's yeah, just taking me out of that comfort zone and talking about my industry and talking about myself, which I don't normally get a chance to do in, in other networking events. Um, also to see if there's a return on investment, to see, um, see, see what inquiries and, and comes out of that investment so they can track that um, in the future, see, see one, if it's worthwhile continuing these, these kind of talks and these kind of opportunities. And also, to be honest, is to raise my, my level of exposure as well and to possibly look at it doing other things uh, as my business scales up and i get people in to help me so i can i think that's a uh, i think that's a really important point right because i think sometimes uh, you know uh, we're all for making money we're in profit businesses etc right and that's why i mentioned the the midterm long term etc thing like for what i do daily is i always ask myself okay well what actions do have i taken towards generating me short-term invoices okay cool what what actions have i taken to midterm growth or long-term growth or both and then what actions have synergized between the above so as i said yeah. before 95 percent of everything that i do now and i'd recommend anyone listening does they should audit it and say okay is this doing these three things is it giving me the opportunity yeah. to potentially generate because the, there's no guarantee that this podcast show generates me or you money there's no guarantee right yeah. but what could happen is someone sees this show at the right time for them when they want print when they want video etc right and that's a short-term return on investment let's say that generates a thousand pounds worth of work for either of us fantastic cool that's a short-term thing but then also it gives the reputation of okay this is what i do this is how i do it this is why i thought have this thought process okay cool that's midterm and then long term is it sits on YouTube for years and has that search relevance. So, you know, for example, we had um, uh, Tom Hadley's first episode, for example. Lovely guy, does copywriting, does messaging for, for larger companies um, as, their, as, their, as their core entrepreneurs kind of want to move away and become not faceless, but less tied to their personal brand, from my understanding, right? Yeah. And the first conversation that we had didn't do very well until probably about three months after it had gone live and then for whatever reason youtube algorithm search terms what was popular whatever just exploded right and then it did really really well so that's what i mean by sometimes it'll be like "Mm, don't know podcast maybe didn't do very well but that's where consistency comes in because you've got obviously the short form clips that are going to get viewership but also you've got that long-term piece that's going to sit online and generate you revenue 
and generate you interest and generate you a minimum brand awareness, but a maximum potentially some invoices. And I think for me, because I've had calls from like, oh, I watched that video and I'm like, that video was three years ago, <laughs> right? And especially if you talk about more generic topics than topical topics, like sometimes we switch between the two, but especially if you're doing more general advice stuff or more general educational stuff, especially if you SEO that correctly, it can really sit online and just magically generate loads of attention. And then it's how you convert yeah. that attention, obviously. But I think sometimes we think too short term, especially when we're in a survival context. I mean, how did you, because like anyone, I'm sure you've had cash flow challenges before you, I'm sure it's been slightly close to the wire, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of these realities that business owners, if you talk to them and they're actually being honest and vulnerable with you, they will tell you about, <laughs> right? Everyone, it, everyone I'm, has I'm, been there at least once. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and, my business is, is is a proper roller coaster. I can go through periods where I'm really busy, send loads of loads of big value work out, um, and then <coughs> especially I've just gone through June, July, and August where it falls off a cliff, and you you're there thinking, okay, I've only got a certain number of weeks money left in the business before I start need to think it. I need I, I need some money. And be honest about it. I need what do you to, to What do you do then? Right. So, so, so let's say there's someone listening right now who, because of economic contraction, because of cost, because of living, blah, 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 blah. Insert reason here, right? Could be a thousand reasons. I'm not going to waste time talking about the reasons, yeah. right? They're in a position where they're like, I've got two months. Yeah. So for me, I knew I'd got work coming in the pipeline in September, October. So I knew that I would be okay. Might be a bit squeaky bum time thinking, um, might not be able to. Yeah, a particular invoice, but maybe I could push it back a week, and and then I know I've got money coming in, in say week week two of September. Um, it's then going making sure I'm visible. So I I, I stepped away from only um, beginning part of this year because I was working on a freelance contract, um, so I couldn't do the day to day networking during during the working day because I was working on a contract five days a week. Um, so my visibility in that network had gone down. But then come June July, I went I've reached out into the network and I went to as many meetings as I physically could do, sometimes doing three network, three meetings in a, in a day. Um, so again, that was building up my profile and building up my, my, my levels of, of, um, of being visible within the network and attending as much as I could. And same, same with BNI. So again, I was going to some of the, the my non-core group meet or my, my non-chapter meetings, uh, again, raising my profile. And and then you do get things like, like kind of interluded to, to to earlier did a quote for somebody two years ago they suddenly come and say no we need that and it's like yeah great so i had that contact that conversation and face to meet meeting two years ago and then it just i think uh, i think there's kind of two questions someone would need to ask themselves if they're in that position number one how much runway do you have if you've got two months okay fine right have you got two weeks have you got two days have you got what what, what? be very honest with your reality Say, I've got yeah. this amount in the bank and that. what does that actually mean, right? Does yeah. that mean you've got a month? Okay, cool. So sometimes I have it and I've had it before and I had it, I've, I've had it multiple times in the business where I'm like, right, I have two weeks and I have to make this amount of money. Right. Okay, cool. Right. So how the hell do I do that? Is then the question I ask myself. And normally the answer, if it's a short window of time, is not market. Because as we alluded to before, marketing is incredibly good if you have the runway. If you don't have the runway, yeah. you need to go directly to market and you need to do what's uncomfortable and what's difficult and what's a heavy rejection led, which is cold outreach, cold calling, etc., cold emailing, whatever your strategy is. Because if you don't, the reality is no matter how well you do your marketing, it takes three months to do and you're going to be under before those before that marketing generates your revenue. So yeah. in that in the, in those periods when I've had them, I've focused on right. So I need to keep the my content going out, I need to keep being visible because that's what everyone in sales will tell you about being visible, right? It's making sure you're front of mind, et cetera, et cetera. And that all it does is it increases the probability that you're going to be seen by the right person at the right time. Right. So you've got to do that, but then you've also simultaneously got to do that and fix your cash flow problem quickly so that you can actually then 
gain the bonus of actually being visible in the first place. So it's about, for me, that's where content comes in really valuable because when I'm busy, when I'm on productions, I can bank a load of content, create a load of content that showcases what I do, how I do it in the best light, but then also gives me a bank of stuff that when I'm not as busy, I can keep that illusion, that marketing, that conversation around what I'm doing and I can intersperse it with the show, I can intersperse it with this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it allows me to actually have that available time because I won't have to edit because I have this bank of content already to then go and hunt, then go and find that work, then go and fix those problems. And I think sometimes, uh, and then for those who are maybe watching this and think about going into business, what I would ask you to consider is how well and how prepared are you at problem solving? Because the yeah. best reality you can be the best videographer the best print the best designer the best this 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 whatever it is that you do the service but if you can't fix problems for yourself or your clients you won't be in business very long in my opinion you just won't completely agree because running a business is very different to being a good operator right so in my case being a good camera operator right you can be an incredibly good camera operator but can you run a business did you find that did you did you kind of push towards the business side but you always were you always that way inclined with your corporate background or would did you find it more it was like oh creative and now i need to make money it it was more the corporate side because i'd I'd been exposed to management accounts i've been exposed to because my 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 career predominantly been production and procurement based so i I knew cash flow i knew that you need the money in before you pay suppliers i understand that process and standard budgeting for, for what we think would would make in, in the next year or so the next five years and where where the business needed to be and what resources we needed to put that process in place. Um but having that having to do it yourself, because when I was in the corporate world I had people in the payroll team, um well uh, HR services or the kind of purchase ledger guys who would be paying all the supplier invoices. Um, marketing team behind us to to promote our services. Whereas now I'm, I've got to pay my suppliers invoices. I've got to make have that system in place that I pay them on time when it's when the invoice is due. Try not to pay them too early because then it could affect my cash flow. But equally, don't pay them too late because then it'll affect my credit rating. And it's having these kind of these disciplines. That I've got to create my own content. I've got to write my own my own website. I'm quite fortunate that my wife is marketing. She works for marketing in the corporate sector, so she can help me on on writing good copy. But sometimes you have to do it quickly yourself because you need to get some a message out. Um, and it's just having that exposure to to yeah, it's not just about doing the thing you like doing. It's it's sometimes doing stuff you don't. Like. And, and this is exactly the point I think sometimes because I think we look at what we do and we look at it one dimensionally and we go, oh, I tell you what, I'll make a business as a camera operator. Okay, well, do you know how to get camera operation work? Do you know how to develop that skill set to actually get that work in? Do you know who your target client is, right? Do you know those video production companies that are likely to hire you, right? Because in most cases, camera operators won't want end clients, e.g. you, if I'm doing videos for you, they'll want a production company to work solely for. So they don't then have to generate the work that way. But the uh, the crux and the issue which I always see is people getting a false sense of security when it comes to their marketing. And... It's always a bit of a red flag for me if someone says, oh, I'm good because I've got work now and then I'm not going to do anything, right? This is notoriously known in the marketing space because for whatever reason, a lot of marketing people don't, they should be very good at marketing themselves, but they, for whatever reason, because of resources, because of time, because of energy, whatever, they're so busy with their client work that they don't yeah. market themselves and they're not visible themselves, which can, can cause them issues in the long run because you're not doing what you preach number one which means your sales conversations are going to get harder but also number two you're not being visible as we've already alluded to about why that marketing journey is important but also number three you're less sharp right and uh, look running a business now in general is difficult right if it wasn't difficult everyone would do it but it's a different lifestyle And that's what I think people sometimes misunderstand when it comes to running your business. I think they think it's a glorified, because it's very glorified on social media. It's very, I'm sat on a beach doing work. I get I get to take any time I like off, etc. But also, what they don't see is the other side of it. The long nights, 
working every day, completely incapable of being able to turn off, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? If you actually speak to a business owner who's actually busy, they will most likely need to check their phone or want to check their phone, not because they're addicted to their phone, because they know there's going to be an email, an inquiry, a problem, so on, so on, so on, something there that needs attention, at least to be acknowledged in your brain, to know, oh, I need to fix that when I go in tomorrow. Oh, there's that thing that's come up. I mean, I guess that opens up a question, though, which is how did you turn off, switch off, relax? Because it's actually the other way around with business owners. Business owners, I from personally, from personal experience for me, it's it can be and it has been very difficult to have that level of disconnect because it, it's, this is going to sound horrible, but it's something that you genuinely care about. Some jobs you're just like, yeah, this yeah. is here to pay a bill and I don't really give a shit as much as I would allude to, right? Other jobs with a good culture and so on, I'm sure there's people who are like, yeah, this is amazing, this is perfect, this is wonderful, and this gives me the right life, right work life balance, and everything I want. But how did you sort of, if you if you've worked it out, if there is, I don't think there is a golden solution. But how do I've you not... turn off? So I, so I, I, I was on holiday in August. Um, I had, had a couple of weeks down 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 in the southwest. Took my laptop with me. We went camping um, during the day. Unless it was something which needed to be jumped on immediately, I would then do it in the evening once the kids had gone to bed, and I'd spend an hour, an hour and a bit, working through quotes, getting the internet out, raising orders, doing all the stuff I do to run my business, but not doing all the networking and and um, marketing and all those additional stuff we have to do to run our business. I just did it what was essential to to get the product out, but it is disciplining yourself sometimes that okay. I want to be with kids. I want to go to the beach. I want to go and sit in a bar and, and just watch things happening. I think not purposely looking at my phone every five minutes to, to do that, but still keep an eye on things to then respond if things do need to come in. Do you get do you get um, guilty sometimes? Like, oh, I'm going to take time um, off. I'm going to feel guilty. No. Yes. Uh, both. Um, so if, if it is, I'm going away on holiday. I don't feel guilty. If it's, um, okay, I need to set the dog for a walk. I need to disappear for, for now, second for a walk. Don't feel guilty for that. But if it's things I'm doing from, with myself personally, uh, play FIFA for an hour or something like that during the day because I haven't got that much work to do. I've got my quotes over today. I won't play FIFA because I've not played it for months. I will then feel guilty that while I'm playing FIFA, I could be writing a blog or I could be doing some marketing activity. I could be could be picking up the phone and, and calling people. And it's sometimes having that, sometimes like you do need to disconnect from your business and, and switch off sometimes because I've got two young boys, take them to school, do, the, do my work stuff during the day, pick them up. And then I'm dad until they go to bed at eight o'clock and then it's done. I think that's a, an important point that sometimes people don't, understand i think there's kind of it goes back to vision it goes back to the context it goes back to are you trying to grow are you trying to sustain are you trying to what are you trying to do right so there's no there's a very it's a very personal answer is the crux there because i think for some people you know and then this is what i mean this is where the misconception around oh being a business owner is awesome right because we have the freedom to basically do what we want but also in the same respect it's down to us to make sure that we're profitable it's down to us to make sure we've got the work it's down to us to make sure that the pipeline's full because we don't have a salary that just appears right and i'm aware that in a job it doesn't just appear but it's it's it, it it does in the different context right because you don't have to you validate it in a different way but you don't need to wholeheartedly earn every penny as in create it from the market out of thin air right in the same way a business owner would but i think some people they look at a successful business owner and they go oh it's easy for you right and, uh, and that's what i alluded yeah. to about like the the, the nights the hours the dedication etc etc et et and i think sometimes w- that's why i don't nowadays anyway i don't talk a lot about my business problems unless i'm talking to another business owner right and for those who are consuming this who are new in business i'd recommend you have one or two people who are either from a network or from networking who are business owners who can actually fully understand that stress, fully understand what it's like to know what it's like to have bills, to know what it's like. And it's not just like household bills, right? Because when you look at business, they're different. It's, 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 
invoice payments it's then your personal allowance then because you have to you have to feed your family yourself your own living expenditure and your family plus everything else with business right so you can basically times everything by four and then you might be close to the amount of money that transacts for a business account but i think some people they look at like you know for example when when someone wins a 10 grand project oh my god you won a 10 grand project you must be rich yes but what are the costs related to that related to that project yes it's 10 grand on the final invoice sure but did you did that cost does that generate three to five grand worth of costs for you right and yeah. also that's, that's you know no, I was going to say for me because my 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 business is is very cost based because I'm I'm buying print services in I'm buying print work in so I've got to pay my supplies so I'm I'm I've got to manage my cash flow just like is this money coming in before I have to pay my supplier can I can I afford to fund it or it's all these kind of decisions I have to make and and then go back to the client like I can't give you thirty days payment terms on this one because I've got to pay my supplier on fourteen days or whatever and it's having that that grown up conversation. Weekly, yeah, that ten grand project is great. But it only costs you eight and a half grand to 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 fund it. And not necessarily what if something goes wrong, but you could be thinking, what if my my supplier does mess up on it and, and then you've got to manage that and you okay, my suppliers are all good, I've gone through all the due diligence with them. They they I know what they expect from me and what I expect from them. Um and my supplies are, 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 are very good. But equally, I just need somebody to, to mess up somewhere. Uh, look, look, you um, can have the strongest credit history, the the the, the strongest account, the strongest yeah. this, the strongest that. The reality is, we're in a we're in a cash crunch for a lot of people. The economy is in an interesting position, and uh, it kind of comes from two two strands, right? Number one is, can you outwork the problem, right? Okay, number one. Number two, do you have a level of compassion, understanding, and and, and etc. with those people who owe you money, right? Now. If you have costs related to that, be a real reality and have a real conversation with them and, and say, okay, well, what, what what can we do? What's possible? And if you're in, a, and you know, I'm sure you've had it, I've had it, where, you know, I've had projects where it's like, look, I need to generate cash flow in a very short period of time. And I'm ask, I'm aware that this is not normal and I'm aware that this is, but I'm asking because I need, I, I need a solution to a problem, right? That's not the same, but also I think it builds you good karma with those people, right? Because yeah. if you're understanding when a cash flow issue is, is the case in, you, you build a level of trust and rapport with those people. I'm not saying like, except like payments and people when they're taking the pay. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, yeah. The reality in the like everything is in theory, right? But you actually need to look at stuff in practice and it's a constant analytical game. So for me, even if you have really, really sure job contracts, even if you have really, really sure invoice terms, the real reality of a business is very simple. Has they have they paid a deposit? Yes or no? And if they haven't and or and or on a final payment term, are you willing to sue them? If the answer is no, same if, if it's on a personal level. If somebody owes you hundred pounds, you pursue it. You don't. And it's it's the same business. And, and you, um, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I've not been in that situation when I was in the corporate world of, of only really pursuing us for money, um, because we we would pay on, on on terms. But sometimes those terms would be sixty days, ninety days, and and but sometimes you'd have this you, you supply pushback say. We really could do this 50% up front, or we could do with, and then you work out, could I buy that service from somebody else? Is this can I or can I only buy it for this particular this particular supplier? Or they give me additional additional added value to what I could get from elsewhere, and then you set that decision. Whether and the, and the, and that's the point with being that's the point with being transparent. That's the point with yeah. understanding yeah. And, and being very clear on what your terms are and what you expect from each side. Because I think sometimes we can get ourselves in hot water by not articulating those messages, by not being clear, by not being understanding in what those payment terms are. And, you know, I remember a conversation I had with an FSB representative a while ago. Um, working with corporate is great. Working with corporate is incredible. It opens up large contracts, large money, right? But it also opens up an opportunity where they're not going to pay you for three months, right? So you can do the work. It can all be signed off. It can all be good. Fantastic. But... You need the cash flow now 
especially if you have crew cost or costs related to that project, because even if you get 50%, okay, let's say you get 50%, fantastic, right? That might cover your cost, but you're not going to make any money off that until you get in three, until three months time has passed and you've got your final payment from that project. So do you have other work? And that's why I say, as I keep saying to people, you need a mix of who you work with. Yes, it's good to get some corporate clients. Yes, it's good to get some larger clients because they do generate larger invoices, but also if you've got some smaller people and or some retainers and some you know just some cash that's coming in it's bread and butter money right so you're less worried about oh where does this bill come from because you know you can play around with where that finance where from a financial point of view you can be okay i'll pay the people who have done the job from this pot and then it will get replenished by that large chunk in 90 days 60 days 30 days etc but also be real realistic about as i say how much runway have you got you know and can I always say to people, have a good cash flow model, whether it comes in your, your accounts package or if you've got a spreadsheet, which works out your book, your money coming in and out of business over the next 90, 180 days. Just have that good model and make sure, make sure you've got cash in the business because like people say, cash is king. And, and Yeah, especially now. And I think so many people, they look at their own investments and, you know, they're very like me. They're, I imagine they'll want to buy a new camera. They'll want to do this. They'll buy a new lens, so, 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 But especially as, as things are getting harder, quote unquote, having that cash available or, or culling down your debt quickly or paying off any debts that you have quickly could be could yeah. be very, very valuable for the business because it is from your own mental sake more than anything else, right? Because it's how do you operate at what time and what reality. You can be in a lot more of a uh, powerful position if you're a little more in a performance model than a survival model, right? Because when you're frantically trying to make money because you're in trouble financially, you're going to react and you're going to be in, a, in a one way, right? And then when you're in, say, a model where it's like, actually, cool, I know I've got three months worth of expenditure, I'm good, like, I can chill to an extent. That doesn't mean don't do work. That means change your perspective on what you work on, right? And I think that's a really important message. But for those who've enjoyed this conversation, for those who want to connect with you, where's best to reach out? Where's best to have that conversation? Maybe it's about print, maybe it's about where you came from, maybe it's about podcasts, opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. Where's best to reach out? Um, so yeah, email me at uh, rob at wittenprintservices.co.uk um, or find me on LinkedIn. So it's Witt, uh, rob uh, hyphen Witten. Um, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn uh, and other social media platforms you do expect. Fantastic. And for those who are starting out in business in the next six months to, or so, what one piece of advice, if you were going to give advice, would you give to them? Um, do it. Um yeah, just just if you've got the passion for the for that particular particular um, area of expertise, do it. If you can afford to do it, go for it. Thanks so much for coming back and joining me, ladies and gents. I hope you took value from mine and Rob's conversation. If you would like not to miss next week's episode of the podcast, make sure to be subscribed to the channel. I'll be back with some brand new content very, very soon. So thank you so much for taking the time to consume this piece of content. And let me know what you think in the comment section down below. And I'll see you very, very soon.